Good evening. Welcome back to the uh, the Bain uh, Author Live Reading Show. I'm Bain Junior Editor Christopher Rocchio, and I am joined this evening uh, by David Weber and Jacob Hollow. Uh, David Weber, of course, needs little introduction to you all, but he is an American science fiction and fantasy author. He was born in Cleveland, Ohio, in 1952. Uh, Weber and his wife Sharon live in Greenville, South Carolina, with their three children and a passel of dogs. Uh, previously, the owner of a small advertising and public relations agency, Weber, now writes science fiction for time, as you all well know. Uh, Jay Apollo is the author of seven books, including The Gordian Protocol, which he wrote with David Weber here, uh, and uh, military sci-fi series Dragons of Jupiter, YA Urban Fantasy, Time Reavers, and more. Um, between novels, Jacob enjoys gaming of all sorts, whether video gaming, card gaming, uh, war gaming, or watching speed runs on YouTube. Hey, me too, Jacob. Uh, he's a former Ohioan, a uh, former Michigander who now lives in South Carolina with his wife slash boss and his cat slash boss. It's a lot of bosses, Jacob. Uh, so welcome, gentlemen. Uh, good evening. Uh, thanks for being here. Thank you for having us. Thank you us. for having us. Ooh, in unison, Jacob. Boy, talk about <laughs> collaborators. <laughs> Well, it's good that we're on the same wavelength. Otherwise, this yeah. would uh, be a rough series. <laughs> All right. So um, how do you guys want to do this? We're going to read from a little bit from both books, right? Yeah. Our game plan is that Jacob is going to read from the Gordian Protocol, which is the one that is out. And the scene will uh, introduce uh, two of our major characters to one another. It is not exactly an easy relationship when they meet. Um, and then I will read uh, the opening chapter from the Valkyrie Protocol, which is the book that is coming out uh, this, this fall, I think, um, in, in October. Have I got that re release date right? October 6th, October. I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, it sort of shows where the relationship between these two characters has 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 matured to uh, by <laughs> by the second book. Uh, so now before we get before we get started on reading, um, I'd like to say that this is actually a series that uh, I I uh, plugged to Jim Bain the same in the same letter that I suggested the Honor Harrington series to him, and that's how long I've wanted to to do these books. Um, and um, I decided to get Jacob involved uh, to help me get it done in a time frame that wouldn't have people screaming and hunting for me with pitchforks. Um, they're going to do that anyway on the other series, but I, I give them another one. Um, and um, I also wanted to add um, his uh, his viewpoint and his voice to the DNA of the of the books. Um, I think it's been very successful. Uh, I think we are a team that neatly fills in uh, for each other with our, our strengths and our background knowledge. Um, we have enough in common to make us very copacetic uh, when we're discussing things, but I'm the historian and the, the uh, political guy. And Jacob is the, uh, I design really cool technology for the 30th century guy, uh, which he did. Um, and he, he and gloats you let me about, go crazy with that stuff. <laughs> yeah, he gloats about the fact that I didn't say, no, you've gone too far, you know. <laughs> um, but the, he did exactly, exactly what I wanted him to do. Um, so we are currently getting ready to fire up on the third book in this series, uh, which will be something of a change of pace. Uh, it will be much more of a um, criminal investigation without blowing up any universes this time around. Um, we decided, you know, that's not something you can do every time you write a book. You know, it's just like, <laughs> you made me promise to. That's right. I made Jacob promise. People won't, <laughs> let you, people won't let you play with their universe if you keep blowing it up. I mean, that's, that's just the way it is. Point taken, point taken. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so Jacob, do you want to set a little context for um, who these guys are when they're running into each other? All right, so uh, we're going to be, I'm going to be reading from chapter 20 of the Gordian Protocol, and it's the uh, first time that Benjamin Schroeder and Rybert Kaminsky meet. Uh, Benjamin 
is a uh, history professor. He's uh, um, from our modern day, and he has uh, just uh, recently had his, uh, his brain explode with all sorts of uh, uh, what he thinks are hallucinations, very detailed hallucinations of an alternate timeline that uh, readers uh, should recognize as our own. Um, Rybert is also a historian. Uh, he's a historian from the 30th century, and uh, his, he, um, he tends to go back in time and insert himself into events and study and bring back you know, lost knowledge that way. And he's also been through a lot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I guess uh, he's going being shredded to compost a lot. <laughs> Uh, yes, yeah, so he, uh, uh, his time machine was damaged, uh, on the way back and he discovered, oh no, there is this knot forming in time. And if nothing is done about it, a whole bunch of universes are going to explode all at the same time. It's going to be like the big bang everywhere across a whole section of the multiverse. So that's bad. So he... <laughs> So he went back to the 30th century and he found in order to get help, because this is, this is bigger than he, his AI companion Philo and their beat up time machine can handle. Well, the 30th century there, they didn't really take kindly to the fact that he was telling them they're just a mistake and they need to be. I guess. Of, yes. Okay. Jacob, you have to, you, you you left out one point here. They go back to the 30th century, and it's not their 30th century. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a different 30th century. Yes. Um, and so that's why they don't take too kindly to his telling them that they're a mistake that needs to be erased in favor of his 30th century. So they throw him in jail which in that particular setting involves them sucking out his neural map, putting it into an AI simulation and turning his body into compost. Uh, <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> I don't know why you'd hold that against anybody. I mean, no, you know. it's, um, so his, he's, his AI freed him. Um, they've escaped and they are trying to find a way to set the timeline straight. And they've, they've narrowed down to within about a hundred years. <laughs> Excuse me, when the problem began. And they need a historian who can figure out what happened in that hundred years because Raybert's like ancient Rome, not 1940s. Um, and uh, they figure out that they need somebody who would have existed in both timelines. And that means that they need somebody who is the result of the same two gametes combining. Um, the odds of that are not real high. Uh, and Jacob is the guy who drew the short, I mean, not Jacob, Benjamin is the guy who drew the short straw uh, in this particular instance. That's why his brain is frying with these memories from another, another reality, which he hopes to hell uh, are, are, are just, uh, hallucinations because he really doesn't like what he's hearing about that universe which had I don't know concentration camps and all kinds of things in it that his universe didn't but, all okay right. I we think, think we've we... uh, set okay. the stage enough yeah all right <clears throat> chapter 20 Benton North Carolina 2018 CE Three heavy knocks reverberated through the house. Benjamin lowered his hand from the alarm console and turned back to the front door. Couldn't people read the no solicitation sign? He shook his head and was about to set the alarm when another three deep, insistent knocks came from the door. Fine. He checked his phone, still plenty of time. All right, I'm coming. And if you're selling something, I can recommend a great optometrist. He headed back into the living room, wondering who it could be. Anyone he cared to see would have had the politeness to call ahead of time, and he did have the sign up, so they were either being ignorant or they really needed to talk to him. A familiar lump of anxiety built in the pit of his stomach, 
as his mind started calling up worst case scenarios, like the police coming to report Elzbieta had been in a fatal car accident, that a drunk had killed her the same way one had killed Miriam, that he'd have to deal with. He shook the dark thoughts away as he'd done many times since the day. No, it wasn't going to happen. The universe wasn't really hell bent on crushing anyone he ever let himself love. That was just stupid emotions talking, yammering away in the back of his brain because he was so nervous. He took a calming breath and checked the peephole. A big blonde haired man in a black pinstripe suit and wide brimmed hat stood a few paces from the door. He wasn't holding any pamphlets and he didn't have a police badge. So Benjamin wasn't sure what to expect. He removed the chain lock, slid the bolt aside and opened the door. Dr. Benjamin Schroeder, I presume? The big guy asked with an accent Benjamin couldn't quite place. Maybe Chinese? For what little sense that made given his obvious ethnicity. That's right. His anxiety built at the mention of his name. This was no random solicitor. What do you want? I'm sorry, have I come at a bad time? If you like, I can return later. It's literally no trouble at all. No, that's fine. You're here now, just tell me what this is about. Of course, doctor. The man took off his hat and held it before him in both hands. For some reason, his posture gave Benjamin the impression of a small man trapped in a huge body. Dr. Schroeder, my name is Robert Kaminsky, Professor Kaminsky, actually. I'm a historian, like you, and I need your help. Are you serious? Benjamin snapped. I'm sorry? If what you say is true, then you should know I've taken a leave of absence. Dr. Chalmers is the acting department chair. Go talk to her if you need something. Don't show up at my house uninvited. Now, if you excuse me, professor, I don't have time for whatever game you're playing. Benjamin pushed the door closed, but Rybert bolted forward and the door rebounded off his foot. For such a big guy, he moved fast. What are you doing? Benjamin growled. Get your foot out of the way. Please, doctor, I really do need your help. There's no easy way for me to tell you what you need to hear. Just please hear me out. Benjamin saw genuine fear in the big man's eyes. Whatever Rybert was talking about, he at least believed it to be a matter of great importance. All right, Benjamin eased the door back. Let's hear it then. Thank you, doctor. Rybert stepped back. As I said, there's no good way to start talking about this, so I'll get right, right into it. The reason why you, and only you, can help me is because of the episode you had eight months ago. What do you know about that? Benjamin demanded sharply. A lot more than your psychologist does. You see, I know why it happened. You're lying. Doctor, I'm not. Robert's eyes grew distant for a moment, almost as if he were listening to someone. Sorry, maybe I've been going about this the wrong way. Doctor, I understand a lot of this is going to be difficult for you to hear, and I don't expect you to believe me without proof, which I can provide, by the way. But it may make more sense if you'd please be patient and consider what I have to say as a whole. Fine. Benjamin didn't know what this Rybert, if that was even his real name, was after, but maybe he could deal with the man better once all the cards were on the table. Out with it then. Thank you, doctor. First, I wasn't completely honest when I introduced myself. Why am I not surprised? Not a lie, you understand. Just an omission. My name is Rybert and I am a historian. In fact, I specialize in ancient Greek and Roman history. It's just that I'm a historian from the 30th century. You don't say, Benjamin smirked. Oh, this ought to be good. Please don't let me stop you now. Thank you, doctor. To answer your next question, yes, I have a time machine. Well, of course. Why wouldn't you have one? Have you found yourself marooned in 2018 for some reason? No, it's fully functional. Sure it is. The reason I find myself in 2018 is because of you or rather the connection you have with another version of the timeline. The humor drained from Benjamin's face. 
You see, the timeline is... Rybert started, then frowned before continuing. The timeline appeared to be immutable, which is why people like me could hop into our time machines and explore the past at our leisure without fear of any consequences. However, the timeline has changed, and that's uh, not good. I won't bore you with the technical details, but if the timeline isn't restored, then this entire universe and 15 of its neighbors will be destroyed. Benjamin's face was stone as Rybert continued. That's why I need your help. The change took place somewhere in the 20th century, before you were born. I don't have detailed records on this period, and my knowledge of ancient societies is, as you can imagine, <clears throat> next to useless here. I need someone with first-hand knowledge of what the 20th century should be. The trait I've searched for is a pregnancy that occurred after the timeline diverged, a pregnancy that occurred in both timelines, which happens a lot less than you might think. Those rare people would then be able to resonate with the timeline's previous state, and their minds could then develop a connection to their alternate selves. <clears throat> Pardon me. Benjamin's frozen helium glare should have flash frozen his visitor where he stood. You, Dr. Schroeder, are one of those people. Your mental breakdown was nothing of the sort. All of those memories are real. They're simply from another version of the time stream one that must be restored. The timeline must be set right, and I need your help to do it. Benjamin exhaled deeply as powerful emotions crashed and echoed deep inside him. Dr. Schroeder, I'm sure this is a lot to take. He slammed the door in Rybert's face, locked the bolt, and turned away. Um, doctor? Rybert knocked again. I'm not finished yet. Yes, you are. Go away. Go the hell away. Those memories were real? Impossible. Absolutely impossible. They were delusions brought on by an overactive imagination. Nothing more. He'd come too far and fought through too much to succumb and lose himself in that dark chasm of alien memories now. Doctor, could you please open the door? Rybert jangled the knob. I know this comes as a shock, but I'm more than willing to help talk you through it. If you're really from the future, why don't you just vaporize the door with your laser pistol? He spat. I don't have one. Besides, they don't work like that. Forget it. I'm done talking to you. Just go away. Wood splintered behind him, and he turned to find the door open with Rybert frowning down at a lock ripped free of the wall, but still attached to the door. Sorry, the big man said bashfully. I honestly didn't mean to do that. Get out of my house! Doctor, please calm down. He stepped in and suddenly smiled. Hey, consider the bright side of the situation. You're not crazy. There's a perfectly reasonable and wholly scientific explanation for everything that's happened to you. You think what you just said is reasonable? Well, yes, Rybert said. Doctor, perhaps I didn't stress this enough. The universe will be destroyed if the timeline isn't repaired. But that doesn't even make any sense. How does changing the past destroy the universe? Well, put simply, there's a lot of energy pouring into our, uni our universe from the 15 neighbors we're entangled with. When that energy hits what we call the edge of existence in about 1,300 years, a measurement made from an absolute reference, you, mind you, the entire universe will explode in a cataclysm that will make the Big Bang look like cheap fireworks. 1,300 years. 1,300 years! Benjamin laughed sadly. How is any of that my problem? Uh, technically, it's everyone's problem. Besides, you have the knowledge I need to prevent it. Do you have any concept of what's different? No, Rybert said carefully but I'd love to hear all about it. Death, Benjamin shouted, backing into the kitchen. That's what's different. Try these numbers on for size. 30 million in the Chinese Revolution, 50 million in Stalin's Soviet Union, 80 million in World War II. Oh, and let's not forget the industrialized genocide of the Jews. 
Okay, yeah. Rybert followed him into the kitchen. I'll grant you, those are some big numbers. But we're talking about saving an entire universe here. I hate to break morality down to mathematics, but a couple million is like a drop in the ocean compared to the apocalypse I'm trying to stop. No, that's not it at all. You're asking me to help you murder millions of people by changing the past. And not just them, but their children and their children's children all the way up to your 30th century. How many lives is that? How much blood are you trying to coat my hands with? Uh, did I mention that another 15 universes blow up along with ours? I, I may have missed that detail. So it's actually a drop in a whole row of vast oceans. A thousand years from now. So I say, who the fuck cares? Well, I care. And you should too. Either you're lying, in which case you're crazier than me, or you're telling the truth, which means I'd be crazy to help you. But think of the lives you'll be saving. No way. No fucking way. Tears trailed down Benjamin's cheeks. His breathing was jagged, shallow, and the icy tendrils of an anxiety attacks prelude tightened the muscles in his chest. He'd come too far to go to pieces now. This madman was lying. He had to be. None of those memories were real. It was all in his head. It had to be. Doctor, please. The big, man, the big man spoke in a soft, pitying tone. If you would just calm down and seriously think about what you're saying. You don't understand. He cannot be allowed to live. He? Rybert keyed in on the word. Which he would that be? I told you to get out. Benjamin grabbed the cleaver from the wooden stand on the counter and brandished it at Rybert. Yeah, um, how to be polite about this? He pointed at the blade. I know you're trying to threaten me, threaten me, but that really doesn't do the trick anymore. Get out, get out, get out. Rybert frowned down at the advancing cleaver. All right, I'll leave. He put his hat back on. But please take some time and give what I said some serious thought. Also, what? Benjamin fumed. I truly am sorry about the door. He left, the door swung shut, and the broken lock crunched against splintered wood. End of scene. I can't imagine why Benjamin wasn't just delighted to see him. I mean, <laughs> you know, under the circumstances. Their, their relationship has what could be characterized as a rocky start. I, I guess you could. I mean, you know. um, now, in the course of the rest of the book, uh, the Gordian Protocol that uh, that uh, Jacob was just reading from, despite Benjamin's initial reluctance, he gets fully on board with uh, repairing the time stream. One of the issues that he has is that the woman he's fallen in love with is Polish, and all of her grandparents were in Poland in, and, and Jewish, um, and all of her grandparents were in Poland in the 1940s. And the he in question is Adolf Hitler, who was assassinated in, in this other universe. Uh, so if he fixes the timeline, he edits her out of existence, and he's not prepared to do that. Um, and she tells him, basically, you have to. And he says, but, 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 and she says, do you think that I really want to live at the expense of 15 universes, 15 Milky Ways, 15, you know, no, you know, we got to fix it. So he, he signs on to do it. Um, and since Jacob and I were writing the book and we're perfectly willing to put them through the ringer, uh, but we are softies at heart. Um, she survives. Um, and uh, among the people that they have recruited is Benjamin's grandfather, who was a very interesting fellow from, uh, from World War II. In uh, our universe, he was part of the Galen organization, uh, which was uh, uh, trying to, they were involved in the, in the uh, July assassination plot against Hitler, um, etc. cetera. He, um, He's the reason that the entire Schroeder family has this almost um, fetish 
about uh, responsibility because he blames himself. He was an early supporter of the Nazis. Um, he was, uh, what, Jacob, he was like 16 at the end of World War I, something like that. Um, and he's, he grew up in a Germany which was ashamed and defeated, and it wasn't until Kristallnacht when he realized that the anti-Semitism of the, of the Nazis, they were dead serious about it, that it wasn't just propaganda, and that was the point at which he, he began to realize that he, as a member of the German aristocracy and an army officer, uh, had given his oath to the one of the worst criminals in the history of the human race. Um, in the alternate universe, after um, Hitler is assassinated, um, Klaus Wilhelm von Schroeder takes uh, a leading role in uh, creating the uh, the new post-Hitler Germany. Um, and um, is a uh, senior commander in the Great Eastern War, which breaks out uh, a few years after uh, World War II would, would have broken out in, in our timeline, and is fought between an alliance of Europe and um, the Soviet Union. Um, he becomes the governor of, um, of Ukraine while the Ukrainians are setting up their own independent government following the Great Eastern War. Um, and it is while he is uh, governor of Ukraine uh, that he is recruited uh, by Jacob and Benjamin to help them fix the problem because he has detailed, intimate knowledge of everything that led up to the assassination. Rybert and Benjamin. Beg your pardon? I'm sorry, I said, I said Jacob, didn't I? <laughs> didn't I? Okay, anytime I say Jacob in reference to the book, unless I think, and he wrote it, it's, it's really Benjamin. Okay, that, what can I say? Um, at any rate, um, Klaus Wilhelm takes a leading role in fixing things, and he eventually becomes uh, the commanding officer of something called the Gordian Division uh, in the 30th century. And the Gordian Division is the uh, division of um, Cispal, uh, Cisco, um, which is um, Cis system government is the 30th century that Raybert comes from. Cispal are the are the are the essentially the kind of combination police and military organization, um, and the Gordian Division is uh, a portion of Cispal. And at the end of the book, Raybert comes back to recruit. Our Benjamin. The Benjamin you were just hearing about comes to a very messy end, um, but all of his memories survive in another Benjamin, our Benjamin. It gets complicated, but it works. Anyway, this is uh, chapter one of the Valkyrie Protocol, um, and um, it goes like this. Chapter one, Schloss von Schroeder, Siskov, 2980 CE. It was a small chapel. It was also warm, despite the snow fanged wind. Despite, despite the snow, the ice fanged wind drove against the ancient rose window above the altar. It had been lovingly maintained for over fifteen hundred years, and it had been provided with proper heating and air conditioning six centuries before this cold and snowy night. Despite that, the sense of its age filled the participants' nostrils with a subliminal scent of dust, of leather bindings and printer's ink. Not because there was any dust, but because there ought to have been. Because that many endless years were a palpable presence peopled with all the other human beings who had passed through this chapel. A lot of those people had been named Schroeder. The Schloss's current owner was not named Schroeder, but the title of Grafen von Schroeder had passed to her through a matrilineal cadet line when the last Schroeder to hold it died without issue in 2653. The direct Schuler Schroeder line had ceased to exist, but the current Grafen had been only too willing to offer the chapel's use tonight. Klaus Wilhelm von Schroeder stood just outside the sanctuary's rail. He looked a bit odd in the chapel's setting, and not simply because it had been built so many centuries before. He was clad in the formal white tie of a thousand years in the past, which was enormously anachronistic in itself, but it seemed even more so in his case because no one in the 30th century had ever seen him in it. His normal, 
invariable, actually, attire was a perfectly tailored uniform in what had once been called field grau, with the golden eye and bared so sword shoulder patch of Sispal's Gordian division and a vice commissioner's insignia. Whoops. Seeing him in anything else was a bit like catching God in his bathrobe, Benjamin Schroeder thought. On the other hand, he admitted that patriarchal simile might have occurred to him because Klaus Wilhelm von Schroeder also happened to be his grandfather. And the other reason it's occurring to you is because you're both a hell of a long way from home and you're just a teeny tiny bit nervous, he thought, which is stupid under the circumstances. Thanks to his neural implants, Benjamin could check the time again, without anyone else's knowledge. That meant he could at least avoid looking like the proverbial nervous groom. You and Elspieta have been living together for months, and nobody in the entire universe, hell, in the entire multiverse gives a damn, he reminded himself. In fact, the only people this wedding really matters to are the two of you. Well, and to Granddad, too, I suppose. He has dropped that living in sin thing on you more than once. Surprising how straight-laced he can be sometimes, even after all this time. But it's not like he drew a gun on you to get you here. And worrying about it now that you are here is, well, it's a perfect illustration of why no one who really knows you ever said you weren't capable of being stupid. It's not like being dissolved into goo by weaponized nanotech, after all. He knew it wasn't, because he tried that, too, being dissolved into goo. Or at least one iteration of him had, and that other iteration's entire memory, including the highly unpleasant one of how he had died, lived in the same brain, side by side, with the remembered lifetime of the version of him that hadn't been dissolved. It was complicated. He snorted softly at the tot, and the tall, broad-shouldered, blonde-haired man at his shoulder glanced at him with a raised eyebrow. Nothing, Rybert, Benjamin assured him. Just a thought. So you are capable of rational thought at the moment, Doc. Raybert Kaminsky, who did wear Gordian Division's uniform, grinned. Thank God, after dragging your butt here this morning, I'd started to wonder. I'm not that bad. On the contrary, Klaus Wilhelm said. You're worse than that, Benjamin. I am not. Ah, then you remembered the ring? That's Raybert's job. He's the best man around here. Well, best synthoid anyway. That is so 20th century bio-based prejudiced, Raybert observed. Just because you and Elsbieta refuse to give up your meat suits is no reason for you to be casting aspersions upon my own superbly engineered self. Benjamin made a rude sound and his grandfather chuckled. Neither of them had ever met Raybert before his biological mind had been electronically stripped and his biological body had been rendered down for fertilizer, or whatever else the system cooperative administration's reclamation systems had done with it. His current body had been hijacked from the admin's Department of Incarceration in Klaus Wilhelm's original universe after Kasaba Shigeki, Director General of the Department of Temporal Investigation, had decreed Raybert's biological destruction. And after his connectome's removal, the electronic recording of his personality and memories had been sentenced to life imprisonment in a virtual prison. To be fair to Shigeki, which none of the men in that chapel were prepared to be unless they had to, he had been fighting to prevent Raybert from destroying his entire universe. A reasonable person might concede that that had given him at least some justification, and He'd actually shown leniency in many ways. The admin's laws about AIs and nanotech were draconian. Its entire government had come into existence in reaction to a grisly accident in which a rogue AI had left literally billions dead. And its law code was designed to prevent anything like that from ever happening again. In pursuit of that object, it was ruthless with violators, and Raybert, from an entirely different universe, had been in violation of dozens of its laws. That meant he could have been sentenced to a one-way domain, a virtual prison where prisoners effective, became effectively immortal, but there were no wardens, no guards, nothing to protect the inmates from the most horrific atrocities their fellow inmates could visit upon them. It was, in fact, a place which was literally worse than death. Not that a prisoner couldn't die there. They could, over 
and over and over again. Of course, Raybert wasn't exactly prepared to give Shigeki the benefit of any doubts, nor had he known that the director was being merciful, by his own lights at least. All he'd known was that both his and the admin's universes were going to die if someone didn't fix it, and that Shigeki was determined that no one would. And, of course, that he'd been subjected to the ultimate violation when his connectome was forcibly stripped in a process that automatically destroyed his biological mind forever. Nor had he known that there were worse prisons to which he might have been sent. The one he'd been in was quite bad enough, as far as he was concerned, and he'd expected to stay in it for the rest of his life. Until his integrated companion, Philosophus, had rampaged through the admin's infrastructure to break him out. In the process, Philo, who, unlike Raybert, had been born as an electronic being, had uploaded him into one of the admin peacekeeper's synthoids. As a consequence, Raybert came equipped with quite a few military-style upgrades, and he'd decided to keep his present body once he'd managed to fight his way home to his own universe once more. Of course, he'd added a few additional upgrades to it. For one thing, the ridiculous firewalls the admin, better known as the fucking admin, if, Ry if Rybert was talking, insisted upon as part of its paranoia about artificial intelligence in general, had been deleted when his software was updated to link with the consolidated system government's infonets. In the process, Rybert and Philo had made damn sure no admin back doors had been left behind. Look. I know you two are enjoying the chance to give me a hard time, Benjamin said now, but really, where the hell is Elsbieta? If the two of you had been willing to settle for a virtual wedding, like any sane civilized beings, that wouldn't be an issue, Rypert pointed out. But no, not you two. Had to be in the flesh, didn't it? You could have been married in Notre Dame or St. Peter's, but some, hell, you could have been married in the Hagia Sophia, the original Hagia Sophia if you hadn't insisted on this brick-and-mortar anachronism. And if we were both connectomes, it would have done just that, Benjamin shot back. But in case you notice, we aren't. Yeah, 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 Rybert grimaced, but he let it drop as well. Probably, Benjamin thought, because he knew as well as Benjamin did that the real reason Benjamin and Elspiet had chosen this venue was to honor Klaus Wilhelm. God only knew how many Schroeders had been married in this chapel over the endless, dusty years, but Klaus Wilhelm was among them. He and his first wife had been married on this very stone floor. Well, Benjamin reminded himself, not on this stone floor, actually. The chapel in which Klaus Wilhelm had been married no longer existed. For that matter, his entire universe no longer existed. He and Elsbieta Bramowski were, in fact, survivors of that dead universe, and Benjamin, or the version of him that had died there, had helped to murder it. There'd been no choice. That iteration of the admin's universe should never have existed. It had been created out of the chaos of the Gordian Knot, which had twisted 16 universes together into a lethal cluster a seething mass of temporal energy which would have destroyed them all if it had not been undone. And so they had unknotted them, and the price had been Klaus Wilhelm and Elsbieta's own universe, and the life of the Benjamin Schroeder who had been born of it. Fifteen out of the sixteen universes entangled in the knot survived because of that terrible sacrifice. A 94% survival rate was pretty damn good, Benjamin told himself again. He told himself that a lot when the ghosts of that vanished universe invaded his dreams. And it was true. He knew it was true, but somehow that didn't help on the bad nights. What helped on those nights was Elspieta. Speaking of whom... I'm going to calm her, he announced. I'm starting to get genuinely worried. She's the most compulsively, I'd almost say psychotically, except that she'd find out I had and hurt me, punctual person I know. It's not like her to be running late, especially on a day like this. Don't you dare, Rybert said, poking him in the chest with a large and very strong finger. Benjamin Schroeder was a tall, broad-shouldered man himself, almost as tall and broad-shouldered as his grandfather but that poke was enough to put him back on his heels. He rubbed his chest, glaring at Raybert, and the synthoid shook his head. Doc, I know you're a really smart guy, so I'm wondering why it hasn't occurred to you that Elsbia wouldn't be running late by accident? 
or rather that she would have already calmed you if things weren't going according to plan. Plan? Benjamin eyed Raybert narrowly. Plan? Nobody told me about any plan except coming here and getting married, leaving on our honeymoon, you know, what all of us have been talking about for like weeks. And this is one of your best analysts, sir. Raybert looked at Klaus Wilhelm and shook his head sadly. To be fair, Klaus Wilhelm replied, Benjamin is one of my best researchers. Calling him an analyst is a bit of a stretch. He lacks a certain something for that role, a certain skepticism, perhaps. Are you sure that's the best word for it? Raybert asked. Skepticism, I mean. You had another one in mind? As a matter of fact, I was thinking paranoia might be a better way to put it. Although, if pressed, I'd have to admit that devious would run a close second. Fair, fair, Klaus Wilhelm nodded with a magisterial air. Be that as it may, however, you are sadly correct that Benjamin never saw it coming. Saw what coming, Benjamin demanded, looking back and forth between them. Saw this coming, a hulking red-haired Viking who looked utterly bizarre and yet inevitable in a 23rd century tuxedo and a horned helmet, crowed exultantly as he materialized out of the chapel's air or, more precisely, out of the all-pervasive Cisco of Infonet and into everyone's shared virtual vision. His helmet did indeed have horns on it, in a nod to inaccurate renditions of Vikings, but those horns protruded out of the helmet of a 21st century fighter pilot. His flowing red beard, braided into a neat fork for the occasion, spread over the frilled lace of his shirt front, and impossibly white teeth flashed in an improbably wide smile as he beamed at Benjamin. Benjamin glared at him, but Philosophus only smiled even more broadly, bowed like a helmeted maitre d', and waved one hand expressively at the chapel doors. Benjamin turned to follow the gesture automatically, and froze as the doors swept open and revealed Elzbieta Abramovsky standing upon the threshold. She wore a stunning wedding gown, and a beam of light from no visible source appeared as Philosophus avatar snapped its fingers. The incredible gown's gemmed bodice and intricate embroidery flashed like fire when the light touched it, and its long cathedral train floated behind it, suspended by a pair of countergrav remotes. A jeweled tiara crowned her dark, lustrous hair, its precious stones blazing with hearts of fire, and her gray eyes glowed more brilliantly still as they found him standing with Raybert at the sanctuary's rail. Her beauty took him by the throat. That wasn't the wedding gown she'd told him she'd picked, and it took him a moment to realize what it was, where he'd seen it before. It was identical to the one Yulia Oblinskaya von Schroeder, Grafen von Schroeder, Klaus Wilhelm's second bride, had worn in the Cathedral of the Domitian of Theotokos in Kiev when she had been given away by Kaiser Louis Ferdinand himself. His throat tightened as the sight of her ran through him, but from the corner of his eye he saw his grandfather's expression soften saw the raw memory, the man behind those icy gray eyes, and in that moment he realized that gown wasn't identical to the one Yulia had worn in the portrait hung in another Schross von Schroeder long, long ago. It was Yulia's. His own eyes burned as that sank home. The Baroness Schroeder of Siskov's universe had never known his grandfather's second wife. The Benjamin Schroeder of Siskov's universe had never known his grandfather's second wife. But the Benjamin Schroeder of the admin's universe had known and deeply loved Yulia von Schroeder, just as he'd loved his aunts, his father's half-sisters. He'd loved her all his life, and he'd been a pallbearer at her funeral and fought back tears, fought to keep his voice level as he delivered his own eulogy on the life of the most remarkable woman he had ever known. And in that other universe, Klaus Wilhelm's and Elsbieta's universe, that other Benjamin Schroeder had watched his grandmother die 40 years before his own birth as her husband held her seared and shattered body in his arms saw her die where she had stood her ground, fighting to her last breath to save her daughters, and failing. Both of those memories were his, 
Both of those Benjamins were him. And so he knew exactly who his grandfather was seeing once again, because he was seeing her once again, seeing her in another woman, just as remarkable as his grandmother, who looked back at him with her heart in her eyes. He started to open his mouth and then froze again, eyes wider still as she reached out her left hand. Yet another tall, dark-haired man stepped into sight beside her, took that hand, and tucked it into his elbow, and they stepped across the threshold into the Schloss von Schroeder chapel. David, Benjamin gasped, and felt a hand squeeze his shoulder as David Schroeder O'Shane escorted Elzbieta through those doors. Benjamin started to say something else. He had no idea what, but then he stopped. Stephen O'Shane Schroeder, his brother's husband, came through the doors at their heels with Josephine Schroeder on his arm. He stared at them, at every living member of his family, for a handful of heartbeats, and then his head turned automatically and Robert Kaminsky smiled at him. For once, there was no trace of the sardonic, often biting humor which had become so much a part of Raybert after his biological body's death. There was only warmth and a gentle mischievousness. Your grandfather got specific authorization from Chief Lamont before he gave Philo and me the clearance to set this up, the big synthoid said softly as Elzbieta walked down the aisle on David's arm. Guess he didn't want to just presume it would be okay when we suggested it. But under the circumstances, the chief said something about making an exception for someone who turned himself into goo to save the universe. Sispal signed off on the trip as a once-off wedding gift. So the boss had Friend Slayton and the Axion go back, nip back to the 1960s and then cross over into the admin to pick up the gown. That way he avoided causing all kinds of alarms by crossing in the true present and getting detected and tracked on his way into the past. Raybert's eyes gleamed as he considered the chaos that would have created. No one, not even he, wanted to add any more tension to Sisko's relations with the admin. That was a given. But in his own personal notebook, anything that gave the admin headaches was worthwhile on general principles. But then he sighed, put away the blissful vision. Of course, that meant Fritz got the easy part. I got to talk to your brother and your mom. He shook his head wryly. Wasn't easy convincing the three of them I wasn't insane. Seems to run in your family. Even in his shock, Benjamin twitched a smile of his own, remembering his own first meeting with Raven. But I know how much your family means to you. And you must mean a lot to them, too, because all three of them agreed to accept neural inhibitions that will prevent them from ever discussing time travel or anything related to it with anyone except each other and you. A tear trickled down Benjamin's cheek as Elzbieta and David reached him. He stared at his younger brother, unable to speak, then threw his arms wide. David's arms were tight around him, and then Josephine was there, worming her way into her son's embrace. Benjamin hugged both of them fiercely, kissed his mother's cheek hard, and then freed his right hand, reaching past his brother to grip his brother-in-law's hand firmly. Never told me you saved the universe, bro. David's voice was rough-edged in Benjamin's ear and his hug grew even tighter for a moment. Never told us a lot of things, I guess. He stood back, put his hands on his brother's shoulders, and Schroeder Gray eyes met eyes of Schroeder Gray. I am so proud to be your brother, he said through tears of his own, and so proud and so damn glad to have met my future sister-in-law and granddad. He looked past Benjamin to Klaus Wilhelm, whose own eyes were suspiciously bright. You did the family proud, Benjamin. God, you did us all so proud. It wasn't really, Benjamin began, but David shook him. Hush, Benjamin, Josephine Schroeder commanded. She reached up to lay one hand gently on his cheek and smiled at him through a patina of tears. Don't interrupt your brother when he's doing so well. But it wasn't really me, Benjamin protested stubbornly. I mean, yes, it was, Ben. David said fiercely. Yes, it was. I can't imagine a universe in which my big brother wouldn't have done exactly what both of you did. Benjamin looked at him and then nodded slowly, not in agreement, but in acceptance. 
He stepped back and looked at Elspieta, then took both her hands in his, leaned forward, and kissed her with infinite gentleness. They didn't tell me either, she said through tears of her own. About the wedding gown, yes, but not the rest of it. Didn't tell me a word. I guess, she smiled, they figure I'm a better fighter pilot than an actress. Got us both, I guess. Benjamin smiled, and the turn, two of them turned to face Klaus Wilhelm. I suppose that in some ways this is a shameless abuse of position, his grandfather said, but I will never regret it. We in this chapel, we know better than anyone else in the entire multiverse what it cost us to be here. And here in the chapel built by our ancestors, I tell you all that I have never been prouder of our family and of those who have become our family than I am in this instant. Josephine, I never knew you in my universe, and I thank God for, in his infinite mercy, giving me the privilege to know the mother who could have raised Benjamin to be the man he is in this one. And I am even prouder to be your grandfather, Benjamin and David, and to become your grandfather-in-law, Elspieta and Stephen, and to have been granted the honor of conducting this marriage ceremony. I thank you all from the bottom of my heart for being who you are and allowing me to be a part of all your lives. Perhaps Elsbieta and I have lost our own universe, yet here, in this chapel, we stand with the people, the family, who have become the center of this new universe we call home. Silence filled the ancient chapel for a long, still minute while the snowy wind sang about its eaves. And then Klaus Wilhelm von Schroeder, Graf von Schroeder, cleared his throat. Dearly beloved, he began, looking at his grandsons and his granddaughter-to-be, we are gathered together here in the sight of God and in the face of this company. End of chapter. Ta-da! So you see that Robert and Benjamin came to an understanding. That was awesome. Thank you both for sharing. Um, I uh, we've got a few questions already. If you'd like to jump right in on them, I'm you game, Jacob. Oh yeah. All okay. right. The first is for both of you. Uh, Alicia pra uh, Patchett wants to know uh, what's your favorite science fiction invention? Uh, I guess Gizmo of all time. So my favorite science fiction Gizmo of all time. Yeah. Wow. That was a big one. A um, fun place to start. Hmm. Okay, well, if we're going to talk about things that totally defy the law of physics, I think it might be E.E. E. Smith's Bergenholm, the inertia canceling device which allows ships to travel. You have to, if you haven't read the books, you have to read them to understand, but it's probably the most bizarre interstellar drive anybody ever proposed, except, except Bertram Chandler's where you, you go back in time while going across the spatial distance. So all the time you spend crossing doesn't ever happen. It's odd, but Jacob, what's your favorite of all time science fiction invention? Well, I, I had a, I had a thing pretty quickly here cause there are so many things to, to pick from, but I've always had a, uh, a love of um, like really huge scale things like uh giant stumpy robots <laughs> well there's that there's <laughs> that but that's not what i picked you ah know? okay um I, i'll have to go with the uh the ring world yeah i was thinking when you were saying big construct that's probably it's just just the you know the, the scale and the scope and it's it's oh it's such a playground for the mind yeah yeah I think it was Jerry Pornell who said, uh, living at the bottom of a gravity well accustoms us to thinking small. Um, and it does. Okay. But, okay. Um, does, does that answer the question? Yeah. Yeah. No, okay. there, the next one is uh, just for you, David. And it's one that I got to say, I get about three times a week in the, uh, the Bain inbox, uh, which is, is there any chance, any sign, any hope for the fifth Prince Roger book on the horizon? Uh, yes and no. Um, 
the series has to change substantially for the next book since Roger is now emperor and he doesn't have an heir. For those of you who are Dungeons and Dragons players, we can no longer say we kick in the door and throw in the dwarf in the plus five plate armor with Roger. He's no longer expendable as the, as the, as the door breacher. Um, and so we have to move in a different direction. Um, John and I have very different writing schedules right now too. And that is, is complicating things. I really do not have the time in the middle of everything else that's going on to, to commit to that. Um, so it's definitely something that we want to write. It's definitely something we plan on writing, but as far as giving anybody any idea of when it might come down the pike, um, I can't. Uh, Tom Pope and I have Tim Zahn hung up right now on the, uh, the fourth uh, Manticore Ascendant novel. We've got to get that cleared away. There's a lot of stuff. Uh, I owe Tor another solo safe hold book. I owe Bane um, uh, the sequel to Oath of uh, to, to Sword of the South. Uh, there's a lot of stuff uh, going on. I'm currently working on um, a prequel to the uh, the Fury novels with uh, Richard Fox. Um, I expect to be handing that one in uh, at the end of this month. Um, and Eric is working on the next. Uh, uh, the next book in the uh, the Crown of Slaves subseries, uh, which picks up where um, Uncompromising Honor ended uh, on the skullduggery side. So there's there's an awful lot of stuff going on in my world right now, and I just don't know when I'm going to get to it. Uh, Joel Presby and I have to get the next um, Hell's Gate novel um, out. Um, I really like those books, but that is absolutely the densest universe that I'm working in because you have three separate universes that all have their own names for every single place and thing on the surface of the earth. And so keeping all of that straight is our index is incredible. Uh, well, you've probably seen it, uh, Chris. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, so that's, that's, Joel uh, has either completed or is in the process of completing a novella, which will be part of the next book, uh, which is good. But um, for those who, who don't know, a um, couple of Dragon Cons ago, um, I face planted into a cement floor and gave myself a concussion. Uh, I broke my nose in two places. I had a whole bunch of stitches inside my mouth. And for over a year, I just I couldn't write at all. Uh, I had to kind of get back into into writing mode. Um, and I think I'm there now, but I still don't have the ability to focus in for like eight, nine hours at a time that I used to have. I have to work in smaller chunks and it is slowing my my production rate. It's gradually getting better and I hope eventually to be, you know, back to close to where I was. But when you combine that with the fact that I turned 67 this year, uh, my, my um, output level, I used to do three quarters of a million words a year. Um, and I just, I think I'm probably down to maybe half a million now, which, you know, if you're me or George Martin, is only like one book. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, the, one of the reasons that I've got as many collaborations going on as I do right now is that I could work in small chunks. And so working with a collaborator, I was doing my chapters, they were doing their chapters, and I was doing it in discrete pieces. And I think the writing held up just fine. It was just that I couldn't do it in, you know. Um, one interesting consequence of that was that I have no memory of writing the opening chapter of a book I did with Chris Kennedy. Um, I wrote it. I don't remember writing it. Um, and uh, I work with Dragon, naturally speaking. So I dictate. Okay. And usually by the time I get ready to do a reading, you know, I've done the entire book aloud like three, four times. Uh, but I had no memory of doing this one that way. And I was reading it at a con and my voice kept breaking as I was going through it because of the horrible things I was doing <laughs> to the characters in the chapter. I was like, Hey, this really works, you know? Um, but it was, it was, it was bizarre because I'd edited it. Okay. I just hadn't tried actually reading it. 
And when you start reading it aloud and your voice is cracking, you know. But anyway, that's sort of wandered a f bit far afield from that. But yeah, that's where we are and aren't on that project right now. Well, no, that's good because there are a lot of questions about different things and where they were, so that kind of rolled them all into one. Uh, save time on those. But uh, this one's for Jacob. Um, it's from, uh, oh, hey, Carrie. Uh, Carrie, uh, Carrie Kotas from, uh, he said, at Fantasy, you said you were a little intimidated working uh, with one of the best-selling authors in sci-fi. Uh, how's that changed with book two? Oh, oh, he's not intimidated at all now, damn it. Um, I'm, it is, to be perfectly honest, I mean, it, it is still, um, th there's still a certain nervousness. I mean, I, I have my, you know, my, my friendship with David, but I also have a working relationship with David, and those are not exactly the same thing. Okay. Um, so, you know, when it's, you know, time to work and, you know, working on, on the manuscript and dis discussing things, um, you know, it's still very much senior partner, junior partner, and respecting that part of the relationship. Um, the, uh, and another thing of just about me as a person is that when, when I'm involved in any sort of project, whether it's a writing project or an engineering project at my day job, I, I always get nervous. <laughs> um, and I, I actually think that's, you know, uh, for, for me personally, that, that level of nervousness is actually a feature, not a bug. That um, it kind of helps me, give me my edge, uh, helps me focus more intensely. Um, rather than, you know, it's like t taking sort of a, uh, um, you know, a less serious approach to it. You're saying, um, you're, you're saying it keeps you from getting complacent. Yes, yes. Um, so, <sighs> David is, and, and always will be, what, one of the, the key authors who inspired my early writing. That's never going to change. <laughs> that's, you know, that's part of the foundation. Um, and so that is something that I'm always going to respect. And, you know, even though I, you know, consider myself, I'm very grateful to be able to say that David is a friend of mine. Um, he's also the Weber. Uh, oh, jeez. <laughs> I'm so glad Sharon isn't part of this conversation. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's, um, it, it, it is, you know, th there is a certain intimidation factor whenever I, you know, present something to him that well, I, let, let, let me, let me throw something in here. Okay. Um, Jacob is an absolutely huge contributor to, to these collaborations. Okay. Um, not only did he build the 30th century, not only did he come up with a way to make what I needed the theory of time travel do, do it, okay? Not only has he retconned a couple of points because I thought of something else cool we needed to do, um, but he, as, um, he and I discuss where we want to go in, in the stories, and then Jacob goes away and does the first draft of the of the synopsis of of where we're going um and i am absolutely delighted to be writing portions of the book that are 100 percent mine but to be weaving them in and out of what jacob has done in the um um uh, in the Excuse me, I just realized that Dragon is busy dictating into my file over here, um, and I just saved the file with all of that in it. That's not good. Oh, don't save it. Good. Okay, I'm not saving it. Um, anyway, the um, I'm sorry. That was a total, total segue. Um, in in the in the Valkyrie Protocol, uh, Jacob did the um, 
the entire original rough draft. Um, and then I went back and did some additional work on it. In particular, uh, a lot of it takes place in the fifth century. And I was, I was not feeling well when, when Jacob handed me the, the manuscript. Um, and I was like, yeah, this, this reads pretty good. You know, I sent it on. And then we all kind of realized that we needed more fifth century context in it. So I went back and I wrote it and I told Jacob, I said, Jacob, I hope I didn't step up what you're doing. He said, listen, the whole time after I handed that book in, I was thinking David really needs to write these chapters. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, we're good. We're good. Um, but one of the things, okay, I may have been doing this for a while, and thank you, Jacob, for not saying that, at least telling me that your mother read you to sleep with my novels, um, but, but I, may have, I may have been doing this for a while, um, but the essence of a good collaboration is that there's almost always a senior partner who is the creator of the series, the whatever, okay. Uh, well, and, well, also, when you when you have two people, there has to be a tie-breaking mechanism yeah. in that relationship. Yeah. It's kind of like when, when I do a collaboration with Eric Flint, okay? If it's in one of his universes, like 1632, then I defer to his call on, on story elements. And when he's working in the honorverse, he defers to mine. There, there just has to, that's part of the distribution of what has to be there to make a collaboration work. The other thing that makes a good collaboration work, though, is that it is a partnership of equals except for the fact that one of them is going to be the tiebreaker okay uh, a good collaboration you are going to maximize the strength of both halves of the of the storytelling team and that i think jacob and i have done quite well um in in these two books um and part of the the hard part about being the senior partner in something like this is the same thing that's the hard part about being an editor, okay? If you see a problem or something that could be strengthened or changed, it's how do you work with the other author to do it, not how do you swoop in and make it over in your image, okay? And Jacob is 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 really really good at that kind of synergistic approach when we when we have an issue um, of explaining to me exactly where he's coming from so that I can take that into consideration and between us we can come up with a better solution to the problem than either of us I think would have had alone to me that's the essence of what a good collaboration is it's a it's a it's a fusion of of the two writers to produce something which will be at least as good as either of them would have done alone. Okay, and Jacob, I think that that is precisely what's happened uh, in in these two books. Uh, so you know, I may be the Weber. Okay, uh, <laughs> Bring it on but, a yeah. Well, hey, you know, no shit. <laughs> okay, if I put it on a t shirt, Sharon would see it. <laughs> Okay, I'm just saying. I'm sending then, her the video with the timestamp if I can. Hey, yeah. I didn't say it. Jacob <laughs> said it. <laughs> Jeez. I'm well, I, let, let, me, let, me add, let me add one other thing, too. Uh, Jacob and Heather are substantially younger <laughs> than Sharon and I. Um, but in addition to the collaboration, they genuinely are very good friends. Um, and I think that that, uh, that um, infuses the working relationship. It's the fact that we just like each other a lot. Um, and that makes it much easier to work with somebody. Um, I mean, I've worked with people who I didn't like very much, but I knew that the project we were working on was being successful, even though you know the, that spark wasn't there. Um, this is definitely not one of those relationships. Um, and I'm very glad uh, to have added uh, Jacob and Heather uh, to our list of friends. If it weren't for the flupocalypse, they'd have been over here for spaghetti again a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> oh, your spaghetti. Uh, so, good. so good. Okay. 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 But Heather's pasta, my spaghetti sauce. Okay. <laughs> you know, one of those, one of those, uh, the synthesis is greater than either of the, you know what I'm saying? Just like mm -hmm. the books. Yeah. 
Yes. yes. <laughs> um, let's see. We touched on this a couple of questions ago to a certain extent, but to give Jacob a chance to answer, uh, what are each of you working on now? Uh, so I'm uh, basically working on the um, the summary project proposal for Gordian 3. Um, so in terms of where Dave and I see the series going, um, this one, you know, we, we can't be blowing up universes left and right um, because we'll run into the problem where um, we we can't manufacture a bigger apocalypse for our heroes. <laughs> Once you've blown up a universe, I mean, what's left? I mean, you know. Um, so this one is going to be um, more a, a more intimate uh, novel, uh, smaller scale, no exploding universes. I've I've sworn off of that for at least two books. David made me promise. Hi, my um, name's Jacob, and I have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I also have an enabler. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> um, but uh, what what this one's going to uh, allow us to do is to um, kind of uh, show um, so, some some parts of the the world uh, Siskov that we really couldn't explore in a larger scope novel. Yeah, so I, think of, what, I think of it as, as societal texture and context, Jacob, is that fair? Yeah, um, yeah. so you know, with, uh, with Gordian and, and especially with Valkyrie, you know, you're seeing the, the upper echelons of, of the government and the police and military organizations and um, you don't really get to see, you know, the, the couple that goes to Red Robin, you know, um, <laughs> and uh, you're 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 going to see, you know, some sides of, of Siskov in the next novel that um, people might not expect. There, there will be there will be conflict in it, but it's not going to be on the macro scale where we're killing whole universes. Um, and I think. Um, in some ways, you'll get deeper into the the institutional structure, maybe, of of Cisco. Um, think of it as sort of a police procedural set in the 30th century, um, and that's what that's what we're striving for. There, we may wind up with two strands in this universe going forward. Um, one that will be more like the book we're planning now, one strand, which will be more of law enforcement uh, issues on, on a, on a multi-universal level. And one which will be sort of the macro thread where we let Jacob come close to blowing up another universe. Um, <laughs> oh goody! <laughs> you know, have his robots. <laughs> well, yeah, that's the one thing I told him he couldn't have in the 30th century. He couldn't have his giant stumpy robots. He's like, oh come on! <laughs> so he kind of, sort of cheated a little bit uh, in the fifth century. He didn't have a giant stumpy robot, but he had this huge Gatling gun back in the fifth century, mounted on a counter gravity sled being used to convince Emperor Justinian that he really, really wants to talk to the person from the 30th <laughs> century. <laughs> so it was kind of you like, said no big stompy robot. I, I know, I know. I didn't, say, <laughs> I, I didn't say no, no 45 caliber Gatling, 45 caliber <laughs> Gatling gun. I know. What was I thinking? You know? uh, we'll see. Uh, this one for you, David. Uh, Joe Lachance asks, uh, is Prince Roger in any way sort of an Honor Harrington Kingdom prehistory book, or is she reading too much into that? Oh, she's reading too much into it. Um, Prince Roger is, um, they're probably, I haven't really got the calendars in front of me, but the Roger books are probably pretty much contemporaneous in another universe to, um, to the um, Honor Harrington universe. I mean, they're probably about the same distance out. I'd have to go back and check to be to be sure on that. Um, so they are totally different universes. They use uh, totally different 
um, propulsion system. They use totally different technologies. And uh, to be honest, it would be very interesting to see what happened if Honorverse Tech went up against Rogerverse Tech. Um, in some ways, Honorverse would have the edge. In other ways, Rogerverse would have the edge. Uh, one thing that you may have noticed is there's a heck of a lot more um, AI and neural interfacing in the Roger universe than there is in the Honorverse. That's because I had already done um, both um, Mutineer's Moon and uh, the Apocalypse Troll, although Apocalypse Troll hadn't come out yet. Uh, Bane lost it for about 10 years, but that's another story. Um, but, time. Yes, well, I got a call from Marla. She said, David, you think this is really funny, but we have a contract for a book from 1991 that you never delivered. And I said, really? And she said, yes, it's called, uh, it's called uh, The Apocalypse Troll. And I said, Jim wrote that contract after I gave him the manuscript. And she said, really? And I said, yeah. I said, I've changed it about three times since then. She said, why? I said, well, the Soviet Union fell. <laughs> you know, a few little things happened. And she said, well, I guess you'd like the delivery check then, wouldn't you? <laughs> and I said, yeah, how much is it for? She said, $5,000. And I said, send that puppy on down. Uh, but I'd already, done, I'd already done both of those books, both of which had uh, highly developed AI, neural interfacing, the whole nine yards. And the Honorverse, I wanted to have a different feel. I didn't want to be falling into, I'm writing the same tech base all over again. Uh, and also, you have to bear in mind that the first Honor Harrington book was written a year before Al Gore invented the internet. Um, so the, some, of my, some of my starting uh, assumptions, if I were doing the same books today, would be substantially different. But I've been working on them for like 27 years now, I think. Um, so the surprising thing to me is in some ways that they've held up as well as they have, uh, kind of thing. Um, but that's one of the big differences between the Roger, uh, universe and the Honorverse. Um, and in some ways, um, the Rogerverse is more similar to the Gordian universe in terms of the way they interact with computers, although the Rogerverse does not have artificial individuals running around in it uh, or functionally self-aware uh, AIs. Um, but no, they are definitely separate universes. All right, cool. Now this is an easy one. Uh uh, Yvonne Jacobs wants to know, did you, uh, did you get your copy of the Liberty Con Anthology yet? No, I haven't got mine yet. I saw your post about it yesterday, actually, and I talked to Grace this morning. I was going to tell you. So, well, uh, that, it, that, would, that would be good. I want mine. Uh, should we, uh, we've been out of the office with the, the pandemic, so the contributor copies had been sort of pushed to the back of the list, but... I think grump, we can get grump, it to the grump, end, so. grump, 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 grump. Yeah, there's grump, a bunch to grump. brandy, so we're we're fixing. Aha! Uh Aha! -huh. So, uh -huh. uh, let's see. Uh, if the technology comes about uh, that you were alive, would you upload your consciousness to a computer? Um, would that be something you'd be willing to do? If not, why? Ooh. Oh, that's for both of you. Yeah. I don't know. I'm getting to the point in my life where those questions take on a certain greater pressing interest than they did when I was 30 and immortal. Um, I think it would depend in part on a, a large, in large part on what kind of an environment I'd be uploading into. Okay. Um, and there are, I don't know how many, I know it's that other publisher, but one of the things in the Safehold books that is a problem for Nimue Alban Merlin Athros uh, is she's an electronic recording of a biological person who is dead. Does she or does she not have a soul? And that is actually a fairly important question to her. Okay, now to some people it, it might not be, but to her there's it is it is a genuine question that she can't answer. Um, and I think that would be an issue that I would be looking at uh, as well. Um, I think probably all things being equal, the answer is that yes, I would, given 
like I say, the proper environment to upload into. Jacob? Uh, I think my, my answer is, yep. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to, to go into it a little bit more than that, um, you know, if the technology is mature and proven and, you know, um, you know, there's, uh, there, there aren't going to be like copies of me, like writing code in some abstract sweatshop somewhere. Uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, 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 I would be down for that. I think. I think for a lot of people, it might also be a question of where in your life cycle you wanted to do that. For example, in, in the uh, Gordian novels, um, most people wind up making the transition into being a connectome, either in a synthoid body or in a virtual environment. And they celebrate going meatless when, when, when they do that. When, and I like this touch that Jacob, Jacob put in. Uh, and this was this was him. Okay, um, you can't record your personality and then upload it and download it the way that you can in in the safe hold books. Um, it's a one way trip because to get a copy that's not just going to turn you into a zombie, they have to read everything in there at such a huge rate of speed that it essentially destroys your your biological brain. So it's a one way trip. Um, and um, I kind of like, I, I like that for a lot of reasons, including the fact from a philosophical perspective, that it means you have to commit to making a one-way trip. Um, but I think probably if the technology available in Cisco were available today, I think probably the vast majority of people would do exactly what they do in, in Raybert's universe, which is, till they're biologically 30, 40, 50, which comes, they have better medical care and so forth than we do. So they, they live longer lives, but as long as you're vigorous and, and so forth, you, you, you know, you retain the, the meat suit. Um, and then you make the transition when, when the meat suit begins to fail you. Um, and Jacob, I think, would you, would you say that was fair? Oh yeah. Yeah. And just as a, an, an additional point, if, uh, if I could, uh, um, you know, upload into, uh, basically live in Cisco. Oh, I would be so down for that. <laughs> <laughs> this is, this is a, a fun universe that David and I have created. It is. It is. Um, and I think, um, I don't know. It's, it, um, Somebody told me that we needed to invent pikas, and then I could use one of them to finish each series, you know, kind of thing. The problem is that each pika would just start spinning off its own series. I mean, I, I can see exactly how that would work. Um, but in, in a lot of ways, what we're talking about here is that Cisco is not just uh, a post-scarcity economy. It's a singularity, post-singularity economy in a lot of ways. Um, and it's, a, it's an interesting playground. Um, I think there are probably societal aspects of it that wouldn't have occurred to Jacob, and there are certainly a lot of hardware aspects of it that never would have occurred to me. And that's where I think that that fusion of the collaboration really comes in and creates a place that both of us find not just ours. Do you know what I'm saying? Jacob, is that... Oh yeah, our, I think our collaboration has a lot of those, you know, chocolate meets peanut butter moments. Yeah, where it, it just, you know, our our strengths mesh uh, very well together. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, let's see, we've got a few more. Uh, you guys got time for a couple more? No, it's getting a little late. I do, Jacob. Are you good? Uh, yeah, I think I I have a I, I can stay till ten. Okay. okay well, yeah. Well, well, we'll call it ten then. Um, Jacob, uh, do you have any plans to do some solo books for Bain or collaborations with different writers? Uh, I have um, 
submitted two uh, solo manuscripts to Bain, uh, waiting to hear back from you guys. Uh, <laughs> they, don't, they don't tell me anything. <laughs> I just um, run the Zoom now. This is my yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's 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 certainly something that uh, I'm interested in in terms of uh, collaborations. Um, I mean the the, the Gordian uh, Division series um, is, is definitely my focus right now, um, and and just really my primary focus in for for writing in general because. Um, not only is it um, a series that I really believe in, that I think it has legs and can go the distance, and um, particularly with the the two track approach, with uh, the the more intimate novels, but also the large scale, you know, whiz bang uh, novels. Um, yeah. That um, and, and also, given that you know I'm getting to again work with the Weber. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm, Chris, don't you tongue. dare email this to Sharon. I'm just All saying, right, I won't. I'm telling okay. Marla, though. But oh. I'm, <laughs> I am, uh, I, I'm, I'm learning a ton and it, I feel that this, you know, working on the Gordian series for me personally, for my growth as an author it is helping me hone my craft so much. Uh, I've learned so much uh, working with David on these past two, bo two books. And, you know, I want to continue to improve my craft. Um, and so that, you know, that course uh, for, for me at, in, in this moment for the short term future, I feel is the most fruitful for me. Well, I um, would, I'd like to say that one reason that I invited Jacob to collaborate on this is that I've developed uh, a skill set which is a perishable commodity. Okay. I mean, you know, when I'm gone, it's gone. Um, and if I can work with somebody who I think is uh, uh, a damn good writer and pass along some of that skill set to him uh to to as jacob says help hone his craft now having said that i have never done a collaboration with somebody where i haven't learned something as well and that's certainly true on these books so it is not you know me stooping for my olympian height you know kind of thing but ideally every every story that you tell should be a learning experience for the storyteller as well as entertaining for the audience um, and I have learned from Jacob in doing this, and Jacob has learned from me uh, in doing this. Um, and I went the traditional publishing route, whereas Jacob went the self-publishing route, because that wasn't available when I was when I was breaking in. Um, and so that gives us um, not necessarily a different mindset, but a different experiential basis. For what for what we're we're working on, um, and again, I think that's something that meshes well uh, for for this particular writing uh, partnership. Um, one of the uh, one of the things that um, uh, is kind of integral to who I am as a person, um, and I, I I see this most in you know my my day job as an engineer, and I kind of you know, think to myself that the day I stop learning is the day I stop being an engineer. And I, I view, you know, the exact same thing as, you know, um, you know, when I'm working uh, on, on a, a, a writing project, the day I stop learning uh, about, you know, the craft is the day I stop being an author. And I don't want to stop being an author. <laughs> I think, I think, I think that, I think that is very true. Robert Asprin and I didn't, get along real well uh but he said something at a con that i was at he said um, professional writers are like rats if we don't wear our fingers down on the keyboard every day our fangs grow through our brains and kill us uh so i think there is something to the 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 notion that you know fish gotta swim birds gotta fly davy gotta write uh but by the same token jacob is absolutely correct the minute you stop learning something 
and avocation becomes at best a vocation and probably a job. Okay. Um, if you're going to succeed in this career, you have to, you have to approach it from a business perspective as well as a creative perspective. Don't get me wrong. That has to be part of your, your thinking and so forth. If you're going to support yourself and your family doing this, because not to be honest, only a, a relatively small percentage of writers can support themselves full time solely by writing. Um, but so you have to, you have to be serious about it. You have to approach it from the, from the, the business perspective, but it also has to be something that pulls you into giving that story, whatever it is that it needs to succeed. And the day you start writing somebody else's story or you're like, geez, I can't think of what to do. I'll recycle this or that or whatever. Uh, that's the day that you are cheating, not just your, your readership, but yourself. Um, and um, that's one of the, Jacob and other people who've worked with, with me will tell you the peril of the ooh shiny moment. Um, oh, boy. <laughs> when, when, when Davey suddenly goes off, he goes, wait, wait, ooh, shiny, and goes off, you know, into somewhere else. There, there, um, there was an ooh, shiny moment. Well, I, okay, I was, I was basically in that room uh, with, with David. The uh, one I'm so, sitting in right now. Yes, yes. And we were going through the outline for the, the final Valfrey conference, the final conference on the yes, outline for that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then David had a new shiny moment and we like disassembled the whole thing, put it back together in a new form in like the course of two or three hours. And then it was like, okay, Jacob, go forth and write that first draft. Like, uh, okay. yeah. <laughs> he was, he was kind of, his eyes were like, okay. <laughs> it worked. It worked. And, it did and, work. And, it did well, work and, out. Well, and you know, I only had the ooh shiny moments when I'm in a partnership that's working. Okay. I mean, I do, I do have the occasional Ushani moment of my own. And sometimes I stifle it because I don't want to tear the entire book I've already put together apart. Um, but it is that, the, that, that um, uh, striking sparks off of your, off of your partner that really produces those moments when you go, Hey, wouldn't it be cool if, and that just injects stuff into the storyline that neither of you, neither of you would have thought of on his or her own, which is to me at the heart of what uh, collaborative storytelling is about. Um, I think uh, the worst mistake that you can make in a collaboration is to, or okay, one of the worst mistakes you can make in a collaboration is to become so wedded to one partner's vision of how the story has to go that the other partner isn't contributing to those ooh shiny moments. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, it's not fair to either of you to do that because you are depriving yourself of the very reason you wanted to do the collaboration in the first place. And it is certainly unfair to your partner if you're just sort of arbitrarily shooting down things right and left. Um, Jacob is resilient though. I can give him a fair amount of ground <laughs> fire and he keeps right on going, you know? <laughs> uh, I actually had a, a follow-up question on something Jacob was saying a, a minute ago about the two strands you guys have in the universe. And this new one's more of a police procedural thing. Before we were recording, uh, Jacob, you said that Tony gave you a bunch of uh, reading to do for homework. And Tony is famous for giving authors homework. So I was wondering if you could share what, uh, what, what it was she gave you to read. Do your so research. I have uh, been working through Ed McBain's 87th uh, Precinct novels, yes. which, um, man, they are so good. <laughs> Um, that's, uh, that, that's been my, uh, my homework. Um, and, uh, I've, uh, man, I, I, I remember I, I started going through just, just the first one, uh, cop hater. And I, I was like, I was having so many ooh shiny moments that I literally got a, a notebook out and was like jotting ideas down. And mm -hmm. this 
is very unusual for me because I tried to be as paperless as possible, but I wasn't going to have my laptop out while I'm trying to read the book. <laughs> so I was, I was going pen and paper and, and making all these notes. And like, I would come across them. It's like, Ooh, Ooh, I could like dress that up in, in 30th century trappings. And I was like writing down another idea. And, uh, it's, uh, I, I've, I've been enjoying the heck out of those. Well, that one of the things that happens when you're when you're reading something like the eighty, which by the way, I love the eighty seventh precinct novels. Um, I think of them and uh, the Gideon novels uh, from the British side as being similar. Okay, they're they're not they're totally dissimilar books, but they fell kind of the same niche for me, if you know what I'm saying. But the thing about every single writer, every storyteller is influenced by every single thing he or she has ever read or heard or seen because it all goes in here and then it kind of, you know, you, you, it, it rolls around and uh, uh, you learn something from watching somebody else tell the story. It may be, oh crap, that was a terrible idea, you know, or it may be, hey, that was really cool, you know, but what you're producing is the culmination of everything you've taken in coming out as your writing voice. Okay. And it is your writing voice that attracts your readership. Um, and I think that people sometimes are not confident enough in the evolution of their own writing voice. They say, you know, how would so-and-so tell this story? How would so-and-so tell this story? And that is how you don't succeed um, in, in becoming successful. But by the same token, you can't sit there and say, well, so-and-so would have told this story this way, so I can't do that. People will think I'm being derivative. Um, you have to be confident in, in the idea that what you're putting together will be you and unique to you. Okay. Um, and I think Jacob has that. Um, it's, I could have been published 10 years earlier than I was if I'd been willing to take the risk of being rejected. And I wasn't. Um, and um, I, I regret those lost 10 years. Um, but, you know, what we've done is what makes us who we are. And so, you know, and I'm totally satisfied with, with, with where I am right now, except that I would like to have not have had the concussion and still be 37 but you know it's like <laughs> what can i say you know yeah uh, um do a couple more um david uh are you gonna maybe do another honorverse novel with honor or have you decided to stay true to the forward in uncompromising honor if honor turns up okay honor will put in an appearance in the book that Eric and I are working on. Um, she has to, given the way that the plot is developing. Um, anything after this that Honor turns up in will be set after the conclusion of the Salarian War, etc. And Honor will be kind of Lessa and Flar from uh, Annie McCaffrey's Dragon novels. Uh, she'll be too senior to be out in the field getting shot at anymore. So she'll be, if if Hamish is still uh, first lord of the admiralty, she'll be first space lord, or whatever. Okay, uh, I do want to do at least one short story with her as the commandant at uh, Saganami Island, um, and I'm I'm toying with the notion of moving it far enough down the line that Raoul gets called to the commandant's office for having done something totally stupid, and gets reamed by the commandant who is also mom. Okay, and after she after he leaves, her yeoman says, "You know, she got reamed for doing exactly the same thing <laughs> when she was here." <laughs> you know? But I, you know, I I don't want to forever totally retire on her, but I just I think that she's reached a point in her seniority, and the storyline has reached a point at which giving her a conflict beyond the personal level that needs to be settled. She's just plain too senior. To, it's kind of like the problem with Roger. You can't kick down the door and throw Roger in anymore. 
okay, I can't send Honor on any death rides anymore because the only fleet she would be in command of is the one you can't afford to lose. So, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. But yeah, I, I imagine she will be making at least um, cameo uh, appearances. Oh, while while I'm uh, while we're here, um, I thought that I would just give another whack to mentioning uh, Mamelukes. Uh, which is also coming out, I think, in October. Uh, actually, it's next month. Next month, okay. Yeah, I was going to talk to you about this after, time. hoping to have you back. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I would love to. I would love to come back. I would just like to say that Jacob was talking about working with the Weber. Okay. In finishing up Mamelukes, I got to work with Jerry Pornell. All right, and Jerry Pornell was one of the people who really got me hooked on on science fiction uh so it was a tremendous honor and i think the book came out well i think we did i think we did what jerry wanted to do um and um we are looking at phil and i are looking at some additional uh books following up on mamelukes we discussed them with tony um and we have a pretty good idea of what we want to do uh, but uh, the reason that that occurred to me is, you know, I was saying that uh, Honor would be kind of Lessa and Flar uh, in any future Honorverse books. In some ways, um, Rick Galloway is going to be transitioning kind of into that same sort of a role, partly because Phil and I, that is, Rick Galloway is one of is one of Jerry's most beloved characters from people who have read the books all the way through. And Phil and I really, really, really don't want to futz around with changing him into somebody he's not. Do you know what I'm saying? Uh, but to tell a successful story, your characters have to grow and change in the course of the story. And so we want to come up with a way to minimize changes in Rick while still having him be an integral part of what's going on. Um, if that made any sense at all. No, totally. Okay. Um, totally with you. Uh, quick Point of order question for me. Uh, yes, Daniel, we will try to get John Ringo on one of these. We've been tying them to uh, new releases. So the next time John's got a book out, I'm going to try to get him in. Um, let's see. A couple more. Um, i scroll down a little bit. Sorry. Yeah. Actually, that was the last question in the queue. Oh, my uh, goodness. Oh, wait, one just popped in. Two questions for David. Um, but they are both uh, upcoming book questions. Um, one was, uh, the first is, any idea when we might see that next Honorverse book with Eric? Um, and the next is, do you have any plans to return to Starfire? Um, okay, the next book with Eric, I think, is being scheduled for next winter. Uh, the book I'm working on with Richard Fox right now, we don't have a title for it yet um is going to be like i think summer of, of next year um i do want to go back and do a couple of solo starfire novels uh, i want to do the first two interstellar wars with young howard anderson and whatnot and i want to write the second interstellar war from the orion perspective with the humans as the aliens uh which i think would be kind of fun i don't know if i'm going to find the time to do that uh, but uh, but I would I would like to um, the 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 basic schedule for me right this minute is to wrap up the collaborations that are currently in progress. Uh, the next solo book for me is the sequel to Through Fiery Trials for Tor because I really should have handed that book in about three months ago and I haven't started it yet. Um, and uh, the next solo project for Bane is the sequel to Sword of the South. Not yeah, sort of the South. Um, and after that, I'm not sure exactly what's where uh, on on the schedule. Um, so far, I am I am uh, pleased with where we are on wh where Richard and I are. Um, the uh, he wanted to do kind of a Guns of Navarone element in in the book. I was like, can't do that. We don't have the technology. He's like, okay, fine, I'll save it. And then uh, about uh, three nights ago, I forgot. There's a way to do the Guns of Navarone, so he'll be happy. I think when he sees that. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, keep your collaborator happy. Okay. You know, um, but yeah, that's where, that's where my schedule is uh, right now. Now, uh, among the collaborations that need to get done, uh, I need to unjam that um, uh, Manticore Ascendant novel. Oh, and Jane Linskull is working on another Star Kingdom novel right now, too. Um, that um, the, um, the story that I did for the Liberty Con anthology um, is going to be kind of the opening of the next novel. Um, and uh, and she's, she's working away on that right now. Um, I'm sure there's something else going on that I just am not remembering, uh, cause there always is, but that's, that's it's off, certainly enough <laughs> off, off the cuff. Okay. That that's, that's where I am. All right. Let's do just a one more. And, um, and, uh, this one's for Jacob, uh, sort of the same question, Jacob, uh, uh, what, uh, what are you looking at past Gordian three? Um, Anything else on your horizon? Uh, <laughs> Gordian 4. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> uh, well, there's, uh, we, we have discussed um, uh, with Tony, um, you know, kind of the next three or four Gordian bro books in kind of a, you know, it, <sighs> Some in, in more detail than others, but kind of the trajectory uh, of the series and and the two paths. And we do want to do for the next two the more intimate kind of police procedural approach before we scale it up again um, for a uh, a, a protocol book. Um, and uh, I, I am also I, I have been uh, working on a little side project. Um, uh, with, uh, with my wife, uh, HP hollow, uh, who's she's, she's started a, a new series, uh, and then there, um, it's, uh, the, the series is called monster punk horizon and, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's pretty crazy. And I she can't wrote imagine, the, I can't she, imagine. <laughs> And she she wrote the uh, the first book, and I've uh, I I wrote the the first draft of the fourth book, and uh, uh, so I, I I contributed to her series, um, which once she has like I think four books ready to go, she's going to do a a kind of uh, indie rapid release strategy uh, with them. Um, but that was actually uh, a lot of fun getting to uh, take. Uh, the, the characters in the world that uh, my wife put together. And she is uh, very imaginative and very energetic and I just sort of ran with them. So, um, but I, I also have, um, like I said, the, the two uh, solo novels that I turned into Bane that, you know, I, I'm sure they're in the queue somewhere. <laughs> yeah, reading got really messed up the last couple of months, I tell you, but. Yeah. Uh... Like I said, they don't actually tell me anything. So I've got like two that have been given to me and that's about it. Okay. The rest is a mystery. Um, but yeah, so thank you, David, Jacob. Uh, thanks for coming on the show. Oh, Absolute pleasure talking to the both of you. On, uh, next, time, next, next time, Jacob has to have a picture. It's yes, true. yes. Um, yeah. Just, just to, to, to briefly explain this, um, my, my work, well, my, my homework desktop had a meltdown. Uh, and then just uh, like an hour before this um, uh, this Facebook Live, my wife's desktop had a meltdown. So I'm actually on my work laptop, which has a disabled camera on it. So, so you get to be our first invisible guest. <laughs> uh, if, ne next time I'll, I'll, I'll have a camera ready. I'll make sure. That will be good because I want them to understand why Benjamin wears bow ties. <laughs> You know, I'm wearing one right now. I know you are. You always are. <laughs> well, both times are cool. So. They are. <laughs> All right. Well, until uh, next week, uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, Nancy Cress is going to be joining us uh, next week with Jim Minns to read uh, from the 11th Gate, her new space opera. We'll see you then. Thanks again, gentlemen. Thank you. Catch you later.